Hi, and welcome uh, to a conversation on uh, the annotation process in room 303. As you begin to uh, study in room 303, one of the things that immediately you will discover is that we do a whole lot of our work from textbooks, um, what we call the hymnal, the anthology, and uh, we ask that you do a particular kind of reading or annotation, as we will call it. Let's get a couple of quick things out of the way, definitions, if you will. There's basically two kinds of reading. There's what we call kind of um, social reading or reading for enjoyment. Um, and then there's this thing that we will call active reading or annotation. Now, I'm going to reference for you the day one packet, page two, and you're going to want to read that closely because that's going to amplify some of what it is that I'm outlining here. If you have that page two, Introduction to Annotation, from the day one packet in front of you, and you're watching this between the two, you should be able to have a pretty good idea of what we mean when we talk about active reading. I'll define active reading as reading to respond. And that response is usually of two kinds. It can be an oral response. In other words, you come to class and I ask you about a uh, passage that you just finished reading and you respond orally. Or, of course, it can be in the form of writing of some kind, whether that be in an essay or that be in an exam or whatever. So uh, this active reading, this annotation as we call it, is kind of like going on a treasure hunt of sorts where you're, you're trying to find certain information that you know you're going to use either in class as you communicate with each other and with me or of course how you're going to do some kind of writing or preparing for the examination. Now this annotative process involves three simple steps. There is pre-class annotations, that's what we do before we come to class. There's in-class annotations, that's what we do while we're in class together. And then of course there's post-class annotations and that we usually refer to as exam preparation and the like. Okay? Now when we think about annotation and pre-class annotation, everything for us begins with our three ring notebook and more particularly the page that we will use, that piece of paper that we will use in our three ring notebook. I'm going to put this on the whiteboard. I hope that you can see it. Obviously you can always um, you know, ask questions if, if this is uh, difficult to see. Allow for this, uh, this square to reference the uh, three ring notebook piece of paper. You're going to draw a line down the center of the page and at the top you will then be working with your pre-class notes. Now it's important that you understand that we use two different ink colors in our annotations. Our pre-class notes we'll always do with red ink. The reason for this is that as you leave high school and move on to university, you will do a lot of your annotative work in red ink in the actual books that you buy. Of course, you don't buy your high school anthologies, and so we ask that you do not write in those high school anthologies, but at the university level, you'll buy your books. And so you'll be taking notes, what we call internal annotation, that's notes in the actual text itself, but then you'll also be taking what we call external annotation notes, and that's kind of what I'm outlining here. At the high school level, we learn how to do a lot of these external annotations, that is to say, notes that we are taking on another sheet of paper. Our pre-class notes, that is to say, notes that we take before we come to class, we always do in red ink. We'll get to in-class notes in a little bit. That will happen on the other side of the line. The first thing we will always do is what we call login. And the reason for this is simple. We want to be sure that we're organized. Back to our master schedule and organizational comments in another, in another um, video. We want to be sure that we always know what reading we're doing and what notes go with that reading. And so we always do some login information at the top. We always will write down, of course, the page number from the textbook where it comes from, the date when we're going to have the conversation, not the day when you do it, because a lot of times you'll be doing these annotations days before the actual discussion in class, which is one of the reasons why you do the annotation, so that you have a way to review, to be reminded of what it is that uh, you know you read. Always you're going to have the author's name, always you're going to have the text title. I've opened randomly in my junior lit textbook to uh, page 118. I look at my course outline and see that on September the 19th, 
4, 2012, we will be doing uh, a discussion of John Edwards' uh, text, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. This is the text from the, uh, from the hymnal. Now, when you look in your hymnal, you're always going to see that there's basically kind of three divisions of any text. There's always what is called a preparing to read page, and that's a couple of pages before the actual reading. You're always going to want to look at that. Then there's the actual text itself. Obviously, you'll be reading that. And then the last part of the reading will be usually some kind of questions, uh, comprehension questions, vocabulary, and that kind of thing. And a lot of times we assign those. A lot of times we don't assign those, but I'm going to want you to look at them anyway because the textbook company that makes uh, those questions, same company that makes the questions for the exam. So looking at those questions, obviously, is a form of exam preparation, part three of the annotative process. We're going to, in our annotative process, read on three levels, and this is really crucial to understanding the state standard of reading as we address it here in room 303. Three levels of reading. We always will address these three levels of reading as we are doing our annotations. The three levels of reading answer three questions. What does the text say? Level reading one. What does the text mean? Level reading two. How can I relate to the text, level three of reading? We'll outline them in a bit more detail now. The way, however, you want to do this is to just write a little number one, and that will designate that you're actually working with level one. You don't have to write out anything beyond the number one. On, of course, a piece of notebook paper, you have that little red line that runs down the left-hand side. You'll just put the one right to the left of it so that it's clean and easy to see. Level one, simple, summary. Whatever it is that you're reading, you simply bullet point in the left-hand side of the line, you will bullet point the information. First this happens, then this happens, then this happens. Major uh, information of names, of characters, or whatever, depending obviously on what it is that you're studying. Are you talking about a poem? Are you reading a poem? Are you reading a short story or an essay? Whatever it is, level one is simply summary. It's a simple approach as you're reading you simply will write down what is happening. For those of us who kind of struggle with comprehension, we, we don't want to go too many paragraphs before we stop and write down specifically what is going on, okay? This will be a way as well, several days later, when we get ready for the examination, to review what specifically was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God about. So, for example, you would read a paragraph or two of John Edwards' classic sermon. You would then write down a couple of things that he is saying and then move on. The theory is, by the time you finish level one, you've got a pretty good little general outline of what it is the text is about. And of course, sometimes in class, we'll begin at level one. I will come into class and say, uh, ask a student, please, would you give us a level one uh, reading of this text, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? I don't expect a student to do that extemporaneously. I expect the student to look at his or her uh, level one uh, notes, annotations, and then just say, well, I think this is an essay that kind of is about this. I may be wrong, but I think that's what it's about. See, that's how that works. Level two, we divide into two parts, 2A and 2B. Okay. And uh, here at level two, we're working with the meaning of the text. At level one, we're simply working with summary. What does the text say? At level two, we work with the meaning of the text. What does the text mean? Here, as some students have said, you get to try and think like an English teacher. Sorry about that. So level two, what does the text mean? And here, we're very interested in answering two kinds of questions. So we divide level two up into 2A and into 2B. At level 2A, we will ask, uh, uh, major themes and messages. Again, here all we're doing is bullet pointing. What are at least three major themes or messages from the text? What I think it's about. Now your textbook will often do you uh, a pretty good service by giving you some information at the beginning of the reading on that preparing to read page. A lot of times you will see that your textbook has kind of set you up with a thematic type of question or whatever that will give you some idea of what the overall message or the theme of the story often by scholars at least is considered to be. At 2B, this is what we call the rhetorical level of reading, rhetoric, R-H-E-T-O-R-I-C. Not what an author says, but how an author says it. And at rhetoric level, we're always working out of our textbook with the preparing to read page information 
called literary analysis. So you'll always look before the reading. If there's anything about literary analysis, you're going to write down any information that's, pre that's presented in that one little paragraph. And then through the course of the reading, if you identify what that literary analysis information is focusing on, you might make a note or two. Again, the key here is the bullet point everything. We don't want this process to be so labor intensive that you're writing bunches and bunches of notes. So you try to learn how to be very, very uh, brief, laconic in your presentation of information so that you yourself can read it and review for the examination, okay? So level one, what does the text say? Level two, what does the text mean? Look, 2A, messages, themes. 2B, rhetoric, literary analysis, and specifically using your textbook to kind of help you with that. The third level of reading, we also divide into two parts. We talk about it as 3A and 3B. Here, we're asking you to try to relate to the reading in some way. We don't ever say in 303 that you cannot relate to a reading. You have to work to find some way to relate to the reading. But we divide this relating to the reading up into two parts. At 3A, we ask, how does the text that you've just finished reading relate to other texts that you're familiar with. Now, we use the word text very inclusively. So that is to say we mean not only things you've read, but things you've watched, things you've listened to, all movies, all music, all video, all video games. Anything that you've been exposed to constitutes a text for us. And the question is simple. How does the text you just finished reading relate to another text you're familiar with? Notice in your textbook, often several texts are put together side by side within a chapter or unit. And so obviously there's some relationship or they wouldn't have put them together. Does that make sense? So you can always start there. Simple. All you're doing at 3A, you're going to bullet point three titles with a real brief line explaining how it, they relate together. That's all you have to do at 3A. At 3B, you're going to turn your annotation page over and you're going to write on the back normally. And this annotation uh, 3B is a paragraph of five to seven sentences. This is the only time in the annotation process when you have to write five to seven sentences. And here at 3B, you're looking to try to answer the question, how does the text relate to me personally? And here you'll write about maybe some way that you can remember relating to an experience that's similar to what's happening in the text, etc. So at 3B, you're trying to say something that's personal so that you can remember. Our keyword here is a mnemonic, a way to try to remember the text so that later on you have the ability to call up again what the text was about. Oh yeah, that's that text I remember reading and it related to that fishing trip where I took where I got lost, etc. Got me? So that's pre-class annotations. Again, just a quick review. Level 1, what does the text say? Level 2, A, themes, messages. 2, B, the, rhetor the rhetoric and, um, and literary analysis stuff. And then finally, 3, A, how does this text relate to other texts I'm familiar with? 3, B, how does this text relate to me personally? Now that work is done as annotative work by you, the student, before you come to class. Okay? So, for example, back to my example of Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, you, the student, do the annotative work for Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God before you come to class, so that when you do come to class, you are ready to take in-class notes. Our in-class notes will be taken in blue or black ink, and that will happen here on the right-hand side of the line. These are our in-class notes. All right? Our in-class notes, we are very interested in two things, all right? We can't write down everything that the instructor says, obviously. And so it's so important that we do some work before we come to class of, on our own. But once we're in class, we're actually looking for two pieces of information. The first is what we will call match information, okay? Match information, simply defined as, Anything the instructor says that you've already written down on the left-hand side of the line. Now, why would you want to note that information? Because if it's in the book, you wrote it down on the left-hand side of the line, obviously in the book, and the instructor says it, the likelihood is that information could end up on the exam. So we want to note it in some way. We don't have to write it again in its entirety because it's already written down for us on the left-hand side of the line in our pre-class annotations. 
What we will do, however, is maybe make a mark, circle it, star it, underline it, to tell us that that's match information. The other kind of information that we're looking, and we're going to write this information down on the right-hand side of the line, is what we simply call new information. This is information that you did not put on the left-hand side of the line, information maybe that the instructor is saying, and you will want to be sure that you have that information written on the right-hand side of the line. Think of it this way. If it's not in the book but the instructor says it, there's a great likelihood that it could end up as part of the examination process. Make sense? So pre-class, we read before we come to class on the three levels of reading. In class, we engage in conversations. The instructor will lecture, make observations. Any time an observation is made for intel that you've already written down on the left-hand side of the line, you just simply mark it in blue or black ink. Remember, your pre-class notes are in red ink, so you immediately will be able to identify any time I'm making circle marks or highlighting information with blue black ink, that's match information. But every once in a while, the instructor will say things that I didn't write down on the left-hand side, and that's new information, and I want to record that on the right-hand side of the line in blue or black ink, my in-class notes. Finally, the third part of the annotation process we said was the post-class notes. That's the exam prep. Exam prep involves me looking at my notes again, reviewing, obviously looking at the information that's match information and making sure I review that, but also going back and looking at what the instructor gave to me as new information, trying to prepare for the examination. Think of it this way. For those of us that really suffer with test anxiety, if I know everything that's match information, that's what the textbook says and the instructor says, and I know everything that's new information, that's what the instructor says that's not in the textbook, what can the instructor ask me on the examination that I'm not prepared for? I mean, if you'll think about it, this should alleviate a lot of stress and test-taking environment for you. Because let's say, for example, the instructor asks a question that's not in the textbook and the instructor didn't mention in the lecture notes. You have a right to go to the instructor and say, this is unfair. You're testing me over information I was not allowed to, to learn before the examination process. Make sense? So as you prepare for the examination, you'll use your annotations as a way to get ready for the examination. And then, of course, we also ask you to turn in those annotations in the form of a packet so that you can get a score for it as well, either extra points on your test sheet or sometimes actual grades in the grade book. The goal for us, in conclusion, is to improve our reading. What we want to make sure that we do is to have a system whereby we are organized and we are studying well, preparing for the examination. I wish you the best of luck. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at the address there at learnstrong.net, or obviously you can always call me. I love to sit down with students and parents and kind of go through the annotation process. In the first few weeks, you'll learn it. Then we will ask that you begin to really perfect it. The goal is that by the time you leave for university, you have your own approach to annotation that allows you to be able to read and learn. Thank you very much.